Mike, Hercules is past the transom. Copy. Control deck, we have tether all the way out. Copy. This is an audio slate for dive number 2016. UTC time is 2010.40. Mark. Control deck, we have Atalanta away. Copying. Confirm happy. Captain, to have the engineers turn on the air, please. Copy that.
control, control deck, I'll stop at five zero meters, switching control to the control van. Copy. Good day and welcome everybody. We are on our fourth time. Is this our fourth or fifth? We started with uh, 2011 and we're so on five. 2016, so yeah. Yeah, so it's our five. fifth dive. We are back at the South Point Pinnacles today. We are going to revisit the area that we saw yesterday, take some more imaging so that we can continue to collect that imagery and produce these 3D models for immersive and educational purposes that will soon be in a theater or museum near you, hopefully. We have approximately an 11 hour dive today. Has that changed at all with the hour that we lost with the launch? Uh, I don't, I don't think so, but it might be a little too early to, yeah. to tell. Okay. It's really, since collecting this compelling imagery is such a focal point for this expedition, that uh, if the terrain isn't providing us that, maybe we'll get back on deck and rejigger cameras for uh, the next day. Oh, perfect. So I am Devin, I am your SCF on board for this shift. I'll be with you for the next two hours. What's SCF? SCF, Science Communication Fellow. I am here to deliver the information that we have gained and are developing and sharing all that information that we have with the public. Get it out there so that you guys can see what we see on on this end. Yeah, it's an important, important role. It's, it's really, a busy role. It's really helpful for us, too, to have someone that helps curate the conversation throughout the dive, you know? I'm getting better at it. I'm getting I, better at it. I think you're doing great. Thanks. Appreciate that. We've been pretty busy since we've been aboard. Up early. Meetings. Yeah, classrooms. with all the interactions you yeah. guys have been. Uh, I was in California, Arkansas, and Pennsylvania today. I over. I was listening a little bit. <laughs> you kind of had full teacher mode going. I was did. Great. One, you two, like, three. All oh, eyes you on in me. The, in the red shirt. So good job raising your hand. <laughs> yeah. I'm coming to call on you. <laughs> you like, can take the teacher out of the classroom. Yeah. Put her on a ship. She's still in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. And it sounded like you still have uh, papers to grade and a whole I bunch do. of responsibilities at I home. I do. I'm trying to keep the kids at, uh, back at home engaged in what I'm doing as well and, and keep them on their toes. It's going to be challenging walking back in. So I just figured if I never lose contact, they'll, they never know when I'm at, where I'm coming. Never know when an assignment might pop up or an extra credit activity. There you go. That's a really good way to keep them engaged. Yeah. Yeah, hop online. Anybody that hops online and says hi, extra credit. I know I see these GPAs now that are like 4.85. I'm like, how did they how get does that over the, the 0.85? It's like all these. Everybody's still kind of getting settled. Jonathan, what are we calling the uh, the camera alignment today? Is this like the snuggle? Like what is the cozy? Aww. The cozy alignment? We, we've got like <laughs> the bunkmate kind of a... I don't think you're on. Your mic's still off. 
Today we're actually set up uh, for true 3D stereoscopic work. So these two cameras are in alignment. This is the first time we've ever tested this to be really fair, okay? Uh, they're, but they're in perfect alignment, looking forward um, for that true binocular vision. Um, so wow. that's the immediate outreach element, right? Um, we should be able to strap on a headset and see the entire porch in full 3D um, as if we are sitting and flying on the porch. And the cameras, are they on the the Ford BioBox yeah, tray? That if, tray? Yeah. If, you're if you're used to looking at Hercules, where we stuff the uh, rocks and other samples in that Ford BioBox, that's where we've taken the BioBox off and we've placed the cameras on there because it's quite optimal for hiding the cameras from the light, mm -hmm. um, as well as that orientation uh, kind of being inside of the ROV, as if you are sitting cross-legged and staring out um, into the deep sea. Oh, I thought you were describing me right now. It's exactly what I'm doing. Well, I know. Cross -legged we're, it, it's, and staring it, out. It, it's, pleasant, <laughs> it's pleasantly cold right now inside of the ROV van. Um, but the, the scientific application for this setup where we have parallel cameras set yeah. up in stereo mode is that uh, we can actually calculate distance between using using just the simple uh, triangulation between the two um, uh, center the center elements of the lens and the distance of the object that's coming towards us, you can, you can calculate distance from that. So, if we do this um, and are successful in collecting even some test imagery with this, it, it'll be yeah. quite compelling for future nice. dives. And are the cameras going to be running in there at like full resolution? Because I know we've been struggling with the size of these files not struggling we're just learning right i would say that the uh we're still we're we're going to be supporting continuing to support the work of ignacio yeah um so for the majority of this dive i would say we're going to run in uh the same configuration at yesterday where we're doing time lapse imagery between the different cameras um but if we do see uh, object of interest or a big coral field, we can switch over and do that full resolution yeah. so we can we can see what we can do. I couldn't believe you guys had me in the lab earlier today and the you've been using the images to build these models, but we haven't really been sharing them as static images for people just to enjoy. Yeah, and just just as the stills, they're quite stunning. There's some bangers in there. Yeah. They were just it's amazing. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to get that. You know, we, we have all these workflows to get the Zeus photos into and out to everyone, but we've kind of been keeping the wide field camera array photos just for the the kind of data lab use and purposes. Yeah. But I think we got to figure out how to break share some it. of the we've good ones out. We've got to share some yeah, of them. For sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right before I came up here, Jason, I saved you some really nice photos in your own private folder. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Just about 210 meters. Our expected depth today will be 1170 meters. Every time it's 212, man. We need to take, I think we need to pull 212 tonight and just jiggle the lens. 3,083 feet. This is a good time for everybody. We can introduce ourselves to our round robin. Let's do everybody it. Everybody okay with that? Excellent. Ignacio, we heard your name mentioned earlier. Would you like to share with everyone what your mission is aboard? Yeah, so my name is Ignacio Rada. I'm a graduate student from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. And uh, my research revolves around using the data we're collecting with these advanced 
imaging techniques to pretty much reconstruct these remote marine habitats. And with this data, I'm able to create these beautiful 3D models and compare it to older video from 2011 to see what kind of changes have occurred within that time. And it's very important too that we're doing this kind of work because we're essentially creating a snapshot of how this these areas look right now. So when future Nautilus people come in the future and map out this same area, we can see how much has changed within that time. And that's very important for understanding the changes in structural complexity, how biological life tends to distribute itself along a certain depth gradient. And um, for this dive in particular, we're revisiting the South Point Pinnacles we're not doing the same track as we did yesterday. If anybody was viewing yesterday, we saw some pretty cool geological features like the lava plume or uh, lava pillows and whatnot. Today, we're actually going to be mapping out the very top of the seamount. We'll be going, <coughs> um, checking out two top areas before gradually descending downward off a different slope. Um, sh hopefully, we'll find some interesting stuff. If Thinking not, we may see some more biological. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping to see, some more biological organisms. Um, of course, the seamount is incredibly huge. It takes a large amount of time to actually yes. create these incredible models of a seamount, um, given the amount of time it takes for an ROV to actually you know, map it out and how slow you have to go to take these beautiful images. So it's yes. really interesting stuff. It is. Absolutely is. Thank you. Jonathan, are you ready? Nope, not ready. All good. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen. Hello, I am Hello. Dr. Kristen Mitchell. I, with the Office of Naval Research, uh, I run the uh, Navy's two largest internship programs, uh, the Science and Engineering Apprenticeship Program for high school students, that's eight weeks. Um, for for students to join a Navy laboratory, one of 38 Navy laboratories uh, for a summer internship, working with a mentor on scientific uh, research projects within, within the Navy and the Naval Research Enterprise Internship Program, which is a 10-week program for undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and there are more than 50 labs that students can uh, work at with the mentors and their um, their cohorts on on naval projects and you guys are currently accepting applications that is absolutely right our applications close on november 1st um, at midnight so those applications are nearing the end so we're looking forward to receiving lots of applications um, and welcoming a new class next summer there's quite a lot of opportunities in different fields during these internships for people that are interested in. Can you talk about a few of what those might be in case someone is? Yeah, absolutely. So we have everything from ocean sciences to engineering, ROV engineering, ship engineering. Um, we have medical uh, sites that students can participate at. So if they're interested in any medical um, applications. Uh, the Navy has those as well. We have about four labs that do Navy uh, laboratory or medical work. Um, we have labs that do naval history. Um, so we have archaeology, we have um, chemistry, we have just about everything that you can think of. It's quite Navy. impressive the things yeah. that you guys are offering. It's really a wide array and so it's worth checking out the website. Uh, Am I too old to apply? Well, you have to be <laughs> enrolled as a student. That's the only you are, that we have no aim, age limits on high school or college, uh, you, undergrad or graduates. And we've had uh, some students that are, um, you know, in a, more advanced than others. Um, Thank you for putting it that way. <laughs> advanced age. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've had students of just about every age. So yeah, there's no limit there. You just have to be enrolled. Um, so we definitely accept students wherever they are in their journey, and we, we welcome that. It's, it makes for a, a more uh, diverse group of students. So, Kristen, I have a question about that. So what if you're... I have you're a, a little friend. soft. Oh, 
Ignacio, if you, yeah, mic closer, maybe. Hello? Yep, better. Okay, so I have a question about that. So what if you're an environmental science major, but you're just very interested in marine science or maybe some computational analysis? Are you able to join those specific programs within the, the opportunities that you're presenting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anything. So, I mean, some, some labs are just looking for students who are interested in biology or marine science. Um, so you kind of have to look at the website and see which labs are doing what. There, like I said, there are over 50 labs um, available for undergrad and graduate students. So you would really have to just kind of look and see what you can find on navalstem-interns.us and figure out which lab would be the best fit for you. And there are labs from Florida to California coast to, coast. to Hawaii. We we now have one in Guam. Um, so we have, you know geographical options for just about everything. So is that how they, uh, if I was a student, I would approach the internships is look for a lab locally to me? Because this isn't really a, there's no housing stipend or. There's no housing stipend, there's no travel stipend, but we steer high school students to stay closer to home just so they're closer to their family. Yeah. Um, but they're welcome to apply anywhere. We have had students travel with their family or stay with family and friends that are close by another site if it's not close yep. to their home. And for undergrad and graduate students, I mean, it's really up to them what they're willing to, to do. Some of the sites have started to cover some um, housing stipends or increase the stipend to cover some of the housing costs because housing costs has gotten so high all over the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we can't cover that, unfortunately. It's something that we wish we could do, but it's, it's just not in our budget, unfortunately. And you probably mentioned, but these are paid. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, they are yeah. paid internships for eight weeks for high school students and paid internships for... Um, undergraduate and graduate students and the the stipend kind of uh, if you return you get an increased stipend and, and the stipends kind of scale according to the uh, amount of experience you have with the program so it's quite nice. Yeah so for I live in Rhode Island near the University of Rhode Island but uh, I think the Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Newport mm -hmm. is probably the closest lab to me and they the association I've had with them over the years, they've got a ton of interesting work going on for, you know, on the, I've been working in the AUV lab mm -hmm. there, but just what an amazing opportunity if we could sneak some high school students into to that lab to learn yeah. from that crew. That lab currently does not. Get uh, out. It does not support high school students. We do have undergraduates and graduates there. Who do I need to talk to? Um, I could probably put you in oh, touch geez. with the right person. <laughs> But yeah, some of our labs support high school students, but not all of them. Um, yeah. It just depends what they, they are doing and also the amount of access that the students need. So you also get a security clearance um, when, where it's necessary. And so uh, students under 18 are not able to obtain that. So it's yeah, a little yeah. bit tougher. So um, it that just depends sense. on what the work is and, and the location. Why is the Navy so interested in these internships? Like what is the Navy get out of it? Yeah, so I mean, the Navy does all of this research in-house, so we need people to support the Navy and support our, you know, our, our the Navy and to support the needs that we have. And that's, like I said, everything from ocean science, so really understanding what's happening in the oceans and also supporting our our warfighters. So when they're actually deployed, that they, we, they're we they safe and they have the things that they need to be able to complete the, the mission. Uh, so that's basically the, the reason why. And we need people that can do science and engineering and, yeah. and everything in between. So we really need the support across the across the board. And these internships are for civilians. They are not enlisted students. Um, you do not have to enlist <laughs> in the Navy. Um, we or get wear that, the uniform. We or talked wear about the, that yesterday. Yes, or wear the There's uniform. There's no push-ups involved. There's no boot camp <laughs> involved. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to worry about those things if you apply. Um, and we often have students return. Um, students often work in the labs after they graduate. Um, That's probably the, a huge motivation for the Navy is to, to, to hook yeah. people early on the interesting work in these labs to then see them through college and then come back and work in the lab and yes. grow the workforce. Yeah, That's absolutely the case. And there are other programs that I do not work on that um, will support uh, further education too. So we have the SMART program that is a scholarship for service program so if you um, are enrolled in school and undergrad or graduate they will pay for your tuition um, and then on the other end you will have a job with the Navy um, 
most likely in the lab that you were working in uh, when you started. Yeah, um, wow. So it's a sort of one-to-one -one commitment. If they cover like a year of your, your tuition, then you s sort of serve a year in the, in the Navy as a civilian. Very interesting. And an incredible opportunity. Yeah, it really is. It's a great way to have those things paid for. I mean, yeah. paying for graduate graduate school is no fun. So, <laughs> yeah, if you can get it paid student for student loans and college debt are a yeah. huge burden for folks now. That's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. So we're pushing just past 500 meters, and we are headed down to an expected depth of 1170. How long is it going to be, approximately, till our our target? Sorry, that's 620. 620 already? Yeah. Wow, that was quick. No, <laughs> that's our that's our bottom target, 620. We're going to the top of the peak. The, yeah, the top. Oh, of we're going to go to the top six, first. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, 620. Gotcha. And we have three beams already, so uh, we're going to have to hold on to chat. So we're getting close to bottom approach. Okay. Are we doing white balance? Uh, yeah, we can do white balance. Copy that. Roger. You want to be on SPL just so they got some something to listen to? Roger. Yeah, hey, what's this? Wow. That is a lot of fish. Yeah. That is a lot of fish. What a layer. Wow. Highlight. That's very unusual. Yeah. That is a lot of grenadiers. Holy cow. What type of fish did you say? I, I think they're grenadiers. I'm not a, I'm not a fish person. Oh. So I just... I'm not wow. sure. Look at that. Rat tails. That is a bunch. I yes. think this is some sort of, like, looks like a breeding oh, like area. Like a breeding or ground, yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. This might be, uh, yeah, this might be something very unique. Bob, I'm going to reset our DVL. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's a good start to our dive. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Okay. Uh, wow. Coming all stop here. So interesting. Come stop. They're so still. As far as the fisheye cameras can see. Oh. This what is crazy. Looking like on that end? <laughs> I've never seen this before. It, I, it's <laughs> like we're getting more and more and more further downward. Yeah, and they're not being, it's not because they're attracted to the lights or anything. They were here, and we, yeah. we we're disturbing their. Hang out. This is nuts. I get to label <laughs> my first highlight, like literally my first highlight. How yeah. exciting. How wild. Yeah, so for, for everybody wondering where all the fish was at, we the found them. Found yeah. him. He's 18 meters. What's he talking about? What? Oh, yeah. But he's 18 meters delta. This is where that those uh, AI counting tools would be really helpful to <laughs> identify mm -hmm. all the fish and give you that. 
All right, well, I'm going to have to come back at you because I'm stretched out. And then if you can... Oh, yeah. my goodness. The further out or the further back you come, there's just... Yeah, even behind us in the, yeah. the butt cam. There's a question for you to answer, Ignacio. Like, why are they here? You know, with all the sensors and data that we'll provide you. Yeah. Sounds like a nice chapter in your. A little shrimp swimming by. Yeah, at the moment, I don't know why they're all here, as there's. Doesn't seem to be much like corals or nothing, but. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be very exciting to decipher this, uh, this puzzle. I think it's that's one the of the. White patches on the bottom, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is what's very exciting about science, is discovering something new and then figuring out why it's happening. Right. Is there any difference in the water temperature at this location than from maybe where we were that this would make it a good spot? Those are definitely things that you could think about. Uh, the amount of food that's available or back to that breeding ground okay, all possibility so i'm down slope from yeah the atalanta so the i guess that herc looks to I'm be i'm going to turn like around and six drive degrees, up i'd say Sounds celsius good. no major anomaly though in that curve Yeah, it's, it, it was the last 50 meters towards the bottom, yeah. They were just thick. So for, for the folks at home, you know, it's some potentially something interesting. Dr. Ballard comes barreling yes, into the Dr. van. Yes, when Dr. Ballard comes into <laughs> <laughs> and What's says, what on? the heck, we are definitely all eyes. <laughs> he, uh, I think we ought to look at these white things and see what the heck these are. I think so, too. I was wondering if they were. It's, uh, we'll do the white balance shortly. But do you want me to come Almost up at all? can look like uh, remains Yeah, of you some. can come up. Some that didn't make it. The whole floor is covered with them. Yep, Norbit's working. Sorry, say that again? Uh, yeah. Everything's looking good. And we have Norbit routed Norbit. down SAT 3 yeah, or channel 3. Yeah, it's in the corner. Yeah, it picked up bottom first, which was very useful. Please zoom in, video? Yes, sir. Corals? Looks like a bunch of maybe egg sacs. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I right? think it's a whole big breeding. A whole spawning ground oh, here. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I mean the 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 whole sea floor down there is just covered. Raises the question as why this spot in particular. This particular spot. Well, yeah. This is the what top is of this mound though, right? The sea mount. Ah. Wow. We have any fish experts out there? The chat is open. 
Yes. Okay, I'm gonna come up and do our white balance and whatnot. Here. Pull white. Yeah, we're pretty close. There's, you can see that it's uh, we, we're not quite on the tip top. So in addition to running our photogrammetry and getting these images of the, the seamounts and then coming down, we've also got Norbit, a multi-beam sonar survey working for us today too. Yeah, kudos to the ROV team for doing some troubleshooting on the on one of the connections for the, the Norbit in the Ethernet bottle. And it seems to be, repairs seem to be holding and we have that sensor available to us. It's gonna be great because we can uh, when we build the model based on the imagery, we can ground truth that against the bathymetry and give scale to everything we're seeing. And it should be a really, really powerful tool for the analysis of these complex terrains. Uh, we're, we're just doing the Zeus white balance. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how that works. And we will be uh, seeing a uh, black picture for about 10 seconds while we do a white balance in a moment here. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's gotten a little dirty. Yeah, we replace that tape. Looks like it's uh, seen better days. I think we can get a, a good if you would you move the arm up just a hair or the camera down just a hair so I don't get any of that dark smudge there we go thank you Yeah. Uh, All right, white balance is complete. Thank you. We need this tucked in, right? Is that the yes, please. secret ingredient? I think it's interesting. We, we wouldn't have, uh, unless we dropped right on this spot and came through that, all those fish, yeah, but we that's might not uh, have made the association between the, that's this. you know, maybe what's happening on the seafloor with that's what normal. was up above. <laughs> Someone writing in that said that they thought that possibly it was an encrusting That's a feature sponge. of the craft. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we have been able to get close enough to verify that yet, but definitely a possibility. It's, um, we could go back up and film that swarm with the uh, 180 degree cam, but that's oh, kind of wow. up to you. 
You ready for tricloppage? Yeah, I think when the cameras come back up. Yeah. I want to swap spots here with, you know, Atlanta's up slope and we're down slope. I want to fix that. Yeah. All right, we good? I'm gonna go up slope. Sounds good. Yeah. So many possibilities, as if that was a sponge, could the fish be conjugating to possibly spawn? Maybe this is a feeding ground that's coming up, and this is a particular, maybe the sponges are going to spawn and they're here for the food. Lots of possibilities. Yeah, if you would like, we can go back and uh, film through that swarm, flying through that swarm for immersive. That's up to you. Yeah. Yeah, you coming up? Looks like they're still there. That's a great shot. <laughs> log, log a highlight of the, did you do that of Argus? You have to actually change it to Argus for vehicle. Okay. And yeah, there you go. Yeah. You want me to just do it here? Oh, you know what? You're right. Go ahead. We'll do. Roger. Take the page and. Are you, uh, Jonathan, you back up? Yeah, I'm back up. Let me just switch over to the other computer here since Rachel wants to do some other things. Seeing a higher abundance of sea stars. I am. Are, no. Well, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, no. No, they were not. It was troubleshooting. Uh, but it's up to you if you want to go back through them. There are only... a bunch of sea stars on that white yeah. substance. Yeah. Bob, when you get to yeah. where you want, let's uh, let's go up into the water column. Okay. Get this captured with the uh, immersive Fish. cameras, and then. So that is okay. the plan. Yeah, we're gonna go up. Okay. Just All right. Great. Come yeah. on, let's uh, head up. It's clearly a nutrient area. A lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And for our viewers at home, we're going up to um, image a bunch of uh, fish balls we saw. I mean, it'll also be interesting if they're gone, too, right? Like, that's data <laughs> in itself. It is amazing that they were so thick, and now here we. Okay. You know, oh, did, you can was do it both. our disturbance, or were they moving through? Okay. I think we. Uh, I think they're gone, Bob. Oh, oh, to the right. That was an octopus. I just saw something, yeah. 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 Uh, which 
one is it? Robert, what do you have for altitude off the bottom? Uh, we're currently 43 or so. Yeah. Hey, Van, this is uh, Chris in the data lab. Uh, are we picking up altitude to start the Norbit survey? Uh, no, we're coming up to uh, to film the that school of fish that or that gathering of fish that we saw earlier. Um, but it, it looks like we are we did not find them. We haven't really excursioned on the summit yet to make a determination if we're gonna. I'm ready to go for whatever you'd like to do. Yeah, and this they're yeah. All right, Bob, back down. All Going gone. back down. That was so interesting. Can we can we make me a Robert and, and Bob a Bob? Robert, copy. <laughs> Just so we're clear on who's talking to who. <laughs> Okay. Um. Oh, that, that thing runs away. Oh. Yeah. So we're heading to the bottom. We're going to uh, explore around the top of this. Um, it's not this. I don't know if it's a seamount if it rises tall enough. But uh, we're going to make a determination a, a about the. There's a fish over there. Yeah, yeah. About the. Oh, I think we're getting close. I see quite a few. The geology and uh, if suitable, we're going to. Try to build a large. Yeah, there's still there's still a lot of fish there. Oh, they yeah. just they kind of moved away from us maybe, but they're close to the bottom. They're not way up in the water column. Bob, can you or uh, Robert, can you please turn off the mids just to mids. see what that looks like? What is that super bright? Are we facing Atlanta? Yeah. Whoa. Oh, yeah. can you please? Yo, man. What was we need that? to we need to make a, uh, a counterclockwise turn to get out of the Atalanta light, please, sir. Well, <laughs> we're trying to. I can go past it, maybe. Sure. Up yep. slope. Sure. Right? Yep. That that would be better. Yeah, I think our dive plan takes us past Atalanta, so that makes sense. That's a good move. Yeah, we did. Uh, I'm sort of blind, driving blind here, so I'm not thrilled about that. Seven, seven meters? Seven meters. Yeah. yeah. You mean you don't have night vision goggles, Bob? No. no. <laughs> I had to do that with the submarine. I just had a this dim red LED and we were going to a hydrothermal vent. I was driving us up with one dim red LED because we were trying to not uh, disturb the animals mm -hmm. with, the, with the light. That's a pretty tricky <laughs> environment to do that blind. <laughs> it was like 5,300 meters deep too. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> that sounds nerve wracking. <laughs> That was a first. <laughs> it was about this bright. <laughs> okay, so we drove past, so that's probably pretty good. Pretty good lighting, I think. Right? Yeah, it looks fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Just checking it out. 
You could probably come down a little bit there. Yep, yep. That's probably good there. Yeah. Are you good on the record? Yeah, whenever you guys, whatever you like, yep, we're good. All right, Bob, let's head to the bottom and excursion around, see if, uh, make an assessment of the complexity of the top of the seamount here. Robert, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are we going to do our track up to the next point, or what do we? What's the plan here? Um, yeah, science. Would you like to look more kind of at this peak area that we're sitting on, or? Yeah, let's see if we let's make our way to the to the peak, and uh, then we'll make a determination. We're going to attempt to image the entirety of this top of this high spot. Uh, if so, that's going to take a bit of time, and Bob, that's going to be kind of, or Robert, that's going to be the 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 strategy and how we fly okay. to collect that imagery is going to have to be a discussion. I, I think guess. If going this way it looks like we're falling off of it. I think, and then yeah, I think we might have so pretty much passed the peak when we passed yeah. that Atlanta. Like, like it's off to port. Can you go to port and see? I have someone asking how hard is it to pilot the Hercules? Looks like a very expensive and heavy piece of equipment. Uh, flying the flying it's pretty easy actually. <laughs> Robert, you can turn on the mids again if you'd like. Mids eye. Yeah, most people can kind of get around pretty well within like an hour of trying it. Video, is that better for you? I always like more light. Yeah, I do too. I'm balancing some uh, backscatter on one of the cameras, but I think this is okay. Yeah, so it looks like up, up here is more upslope. I'm gonna head up here. You wanna? That sounds great. Yeah. So Ignacio, can you tell us again how this is gonna, all this imagery is gonna help you with your data collection? Uh, yeah, I think we're gonna need a bit of a ship move. Roger that. We wanna keep the lighting in there tight anyway. So. All right. Yeah, so by collecting this we'll data, I can meters. recreate yeah, the seamount and right. parts of it to determine Hopefully find out the answers that we're wondering right now as to why there's so much um, fish, um, why this is a, a particular fish spawning ground, and also the other biological assemblage here. I'm seeing a whole bunch of sea stars and some other creatures I just don't know how to identify yet, so. So this data will be able to help you with the number of species that are living there, compare that to the other data that's been collected in the past and determine whether or not this is a healthy ecosystem and whether it's thriving. 
Yeah, exactly. It helps us define how do we define a healthy ecosystem here in this marine habitat as well, because it's not this. I've studied more shallow environments, and there's a stark difference between the the depth, uh, the shallow, and very deep environments. Yes. Lots of different adaptations that animals have to have in order to live a deeper deeper in the ocean. Exactly. It does seem to be quite a bit of brittle stars. Yeah. Here. I'm seeing a whole bunch of those brown kind of sea urchin looking type of um, organisms as well. Yep. So it looks like the ones, thank you, April, for your question. It looks like what we saw was a large school of rat tail fish, very common in the area, something that we've seen uh, on each one of the dives. Want to zoom in? Yeah, of course. Oh, I get, I got to talk to video, <laughs> I, so. I don't know if I get permission <laughs> to do that. <laughs> no, I wasn't, that was, that was talking to video, but. <laughs> I, I, I will say yes. Of course, yes. <laughs> I get a little excited. <laughs> I want to see it all. Kind of looks like a goldfish. A pink goldfish. Do we have any fish experts online that can uh, ID this thing? We're looking at the guide now. those large eyes that help with retrieving a little bit of light there is at, the d at this depth. Yeah, there is, the there is a little bit of light still at uh, 600 meters. It's not completely void of light. There's another one in the shot. Oh, yeah. Just for clarification, someone's asking, is Channel 1 the 6K camera? Do we have that visible for people to see, or is that just? Channel 1 is uh, our main uh, Zeus camera, and Channel 3 is the, uh, what we're calling the Triclops computer. Jason, you can comment on that. Or yeah. Jonathan, either one of you. I don't know if John, I can't see if Jonathan's. So I think we're you are there. at the okay. peak. I don't see anything in the sonar, so. Yeah, I'm looking at Norbert, it kind of shows downslope in front of us and on all sides. Yeah. yeah, I think we're at the top. And you are full wide. Oh, you aren't, sorry, my pulse. My apologies. No, you are. So let's make our way to the next uh, uh, waypoint where we'll start the Norbit survey. Right. Roger that. Bridge nav three zero at three four zero, please. So it's very clear here too. This is nice. Yeah. That spin, Robert, was just Roger, like thank really you. helped with the perspective. Right at the top of the screen of hurt, there's uh, some little tentacles dangling right there. I wonder what that is. Or tether. is that our laser? No, oh, that's, that's the tether. tether. Okay. Yeah, no. See, we're I flying, told you I was excited about that. Alone. That's why it's so well lit right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I had someone chime in so that the red fish looks you can like come a up some. Menopaki? That's a little too tight. Menopaki? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with that. Yeah, it looks like you'll have to come across Atalanta yeah. going up. Yeah, so as I get closer, you're going to have to come up just to keep the keep things clear. Yeah. But, yeah. but nice fly in there. That's, you're getting some great shots. So. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, what's the uh, bearing to the... Uh, we're heading 340. Okay. Come up a little bit more. did a little Google research. Looks like that. And I'm saying if it's Mimpaki, I'm not sure if I'm saying pronouncing that correct, but Hawaiian name, a soldier fish. That pink one that we were looking at. Yeah, I'm looking at it too. I think that was a really, really good tip. Yes. From folks at home, so thank you for chiming in. If you are tuning in online and you are able to send us, we would absolutely love your questions. Absolutely appropriate time to send them. Uh, we'll get you the information as best as we can. Hello from Seattle. Nice to have you with us. Uh, we're going to probably lose view of the bottom on the going down slope here. Yep. Okay. So for. Uh, for folks at home, we're going to do a survey with uh, Norbit multi-beam sonar. So we're going to stand off the seabed here for a bit as we head down to uh, the base of this um, high point. And what will be nice is if we can process this multi-beam sonar data uh, fairly quickly, we can have that integrated into a map that we can then explore from uh, while we're on the dive. And so that's a challenge to to K2 who's down in the data lab. So are we going to fly high between the peaks here? Or, uh, um, what's the goal? I think it sounds like that's the goal is to do a Norbert survey during this part rather than visually track bottom. It's right, only yeah, for sure. There's, uh, and maybe K2 can chime in with what the standoff you'd like from yeah. This is going to be a steep um, slope, but what the appropriate standoff is. Well, just crossing this saddle, it's only about a delta of 25 meters over 500 meters in terms of depth. So yeah. it should be rather get gradual yeah, at this I guess section. We probably could get to the bottom and, yeah, over the, along the ridge line there. Yeah, once we're, once we're going down the steep part, we'll definitely. So is that what we're going to do? Want to stand off. Science, would that be advantageous to 
let's Keep stay on well the, the beauty of staying high is the wider swath width right we have more information yeah. when we do build the map so i say we stay this 25 to 30 meters off the okay. seabed and then let maybe kt will chime in with a yep. more specific yeah i'm here uh are we looking so we want to do a short sort survey down down the top yep we're gonna survey our way down to uh so our deepest the, waypoint across the peaks and then down yep okay so what altitude do we want to fly this k2 that's for you what are you yeah give me just a second i'm right. determining here you're on you're at 27 meters right now Robert, are you two in a good position? Should I keep the ship moving? Uh, I don't know what we're doing. Stand by. Yet. Okay. Yeah, he has to start his uh, logging and all that business. He's still yeah, we're he's still fiddling. This is a this is a decent uh, spot, but we're seeing the top of the ridge. I don't know. If you guys have the Norbit screen up there? Yeah. 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 So we're seeing the top of the ridge here. So we can either center up on the ridge so we can see both sides. Okay. Or we could step off more so we could get more up and down slope. Yeah. Okay, so we need to come more to the west a bit. Yeah, the problem is if we sit right on the top, we'll kind of get down slope pings on either side, and we'll get okay pings on both sides. So you don't want to do that? Yeah, maybe just just mo go, just stay at this height <laughs> and go ahead. <laughs> Try to keep your altitude about, what are you at? What is your DVL 20, reading? We're 20? at 28 right now. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, about 20, let's say 25 to 30 meters. Okay. If we get too high and start losing DVL lock, we'll bring it down a little bit. Okay. Well, yeah. we can get, we'll have DVL probably across the whole ridge to, you know, like probably 60 meters or better. So. So we're good right here. Yeah, this looks good. Let me just restart the survey to break the log so I can identify it easily. Do you have any? Radius speed or anything? Should we do it? Not particular. Stand by. I think the data rate of the Norbit is Roger. faster than the Herc. Yeah, you can go as fast as you want. The one thing that I have, the one request that I have is set auto heading and keep it as sta keep the heading as stable as possible. Yeah. And I'll try not to tug on the tether so it doesn't wobble around. But other okay. than that. Roger. So we got a nice note in the uh, the chat from uh, Paris, France. Yes. Shout out to uh, Dr. Tom? Drake's big brother or yep. younger brother from Dr. Drake's younger brother. Following along, videos are amazing. Thanks to all for the live streaming and interesting commentary. Okay. Uh, if K2's ready, we're ready. And then April in Hawaii helping yeah. to say. Yeah, uh, looks like Cheetos. we're good. Gee, yeah, uh, Cheetos, yeah, Cheetos, that's, that's the best way. Great we'll be way. 340 the whole way. Okay. That should take us take right there. Finding an unknown species takes a lot longer than you would think to bridge, be able bridge to name it. Bridge, bridge now, 340 at 340, please. First. You ready for uh, camera power back on? Roger. Lots of scientists have to confirm that it is indeed a new species, and then usually it goes back to the person that discovered it that's able to actually place a name okay. on it. And uh, you can uh, engage when you're ready. All right. Bridges plugging in the move. We'll just try and keep it sort of center screen. Just you don't don't tilt it or anything. We'll just try and stay with you. Okay. We'll hold this kind of delta. Yeah, okay. So we don't tug and then, yeah. Looks like we're moving at point 0.2 knots right now. Okay. Do you want me to speed up? Or? Uh, well, we haven't started moving yet. Fair. <laughs> All right. Let me know and this I will is fine. <laughs> adjust. Sounds good. How far is it? You said 500 meters? Uh, uh, yeah, about 460 meters yeah. to go. All right. We're good. Sounds good.
That would take us about 40 minutes to get there at this speed. All right, I'm all set with the Norbit. Ready when you guys are. Roger, we have started our ship move, uh, and looks like we're starting to go. But let's uh, get your heading right on 340 as well. Yeah. Got it. might be an offset though so maybe just line up on me so we're, you're parallel to me I don't know maybe a couple degrees that looks good all right I'm gonna step oh that's pretty interesting What is that? What's, yeah, what's who's uh, who's making the noise? It, it cleared up and then it came back again. That's you. <laughs> what's the noise? Just some Move your your mic cable around. Like flip it off where it's at. Cool. You see those lights moving? Yes. What's going on in uh, scene one better? there? Something coming up. It looks like I guess Siphon F4 maybe. Yeah. Could you spell that for me? S I P H O N. Yeah, we're scientists, not spelling bee P H O R E. Devin. <laughs> Is there a survey system named after Eddie Murphy in the Norbert film? I don't know that that's where we got the name from, but definitely. No, uh, we had a we had a debate about this. Uh, no, the uh, yeah, the name is they're just a um, that's the name Norwegian of the company. company. Yeah, that's yeah. the name of the sonar, and then. Uh, yeah, like Norwegian bit or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No Eddie Murphy connections. <laughs> but yeah, actually the uh, yeah the Norbit is just the sonar. We the rest of the system we developed here in house. So the nice. rest of the mapping and visualization system. Oh, somebody spelled it for me. S I P H O N O P H O R E. <laughs> the more you know. That's awesome. Thank you for that. I uh, just don't, yeah, don't tilt, don't tilt, because you'll throw me off, and I, I won't know where I am or in reference. I'm going to try and center up and go at the same rate, you know. You can see in satellite, so, too, there's lots just of leave it, detritus leave it be. that marine snow yeah, sorry, going I'm, through. I just set the camera so it doesn't wobble with the vehicle. Yeah, just keep your delta, and you don't need to tilt the camera or nothing. Yeah. And then, and you can... Just slug me if we go off screen. Yeah, we should, it should be, everything should be good right now, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> okay, uh, gonna keep us moving. Uh, uh, let me see, let me, what if I turn this down? The max velocity on the heading, maybe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I uh, I went from uh, ten to two. So. Robert, are you good to keep the ship going, or are you figuring something no, out? No, we want we want everything s steady. Bridge nav three zero at three four zero, please. Just, I would just make one step move. Just, just track a line. Just say track a line at that heading. Okay. That's we want. We don't want. It, we don't want it to 
stop start and, and start. Yeah, so I just agree. do one smooth move. Just track a line at three four zero. Okay. Bridge nav. Can we actually just track a line at three four zero for now? I think the uh, the creature with the looked like it was uh, kind of uh, yeah, translucent. Still with same the, speed. Same like speed lights. for now. Thank yeah. you. I think those were salps. That was a salp. 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 <laughs> S A L P. It's almost lunchtime. You had me thinking a scallop. Yeah. <laughs> so Devin, I know you mentioned marine snow, all this falling. Um, so yeah, part of it is detritus. A lot of it also can be phytoplankton that has um, is also dead or had just fallen down due, due to wave currents so and this is really essential to many of the marine organisms down there because they're filter feeders yes and so this is one of the primary ways that food is actually introduced into these ecosystems so when you have large deposits like this at one particular time especially during migration seasons does that make it why say whales would take a specific route because they know it's going to be rich and plentiful yeah, possibly. Uh, it also depends on the well. I think most wells are generalist, and which means that they'll consume almost anything. Um, some wells are very specific, like the North Atlantic right well uh, prefers a specific kind of grill. Uh -huh. And that's basically because of the geographic location in which those wells are found, uh, more colder areas, and the specific kind of grill has a higher abundance of lipids. Um, basically helps to really create a lot of fat and insulate these wells but um, but for the most part yeah it's possible that certain specific areas are hot spots for um, marine snow and for more uh, more of an alley more maybe more like um, an alleyway of uh, fast food joints I guess in a way yeah <laughs> question about the software that's being used to produce the multicolored 3D images in the quad view that we're seeing right now? Uh, maybe Chris? Can yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, that was it. That was the question. What's the, <laughs> what's the, uh, what's the name of the software? What, what is the software? What is so, the yeah, software? Yeah. So, like I said, the software was all developed in-house, and it's built um, from a open source, a bunch of open source software packages, and a lot of software that I wrote myself. The, the and it's all built on the robot operating system. So, the visualizer that you're seeing here is uh, the robot operating system visualization software. But really, all that does for you is displays, you know, shapes and points and locations, and the rest, yeah, we had to write. Chris, how long have you been working with this type of software? Is this something that you've done for a very long time? I think I started with ROS, our uh, robot operating system, in 2012. So yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> The whole process is fascinating. So All the things that you can put together. Yeah, that's looking way better, Bob. Still a little wobbly. You could maybe try turning the proportion gain down. Yeah. Chris, can you describe? No, the, turn the p. Turn the p down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's okay. Yeah, now it's like, well, maybe that's not enough to get back to where it needs to be. 
All right. Chris, what are those colors telling you? So the colors correspond to depth. Uh, red is shallower, blue is deeper. Okay. So, yeah, so if we, uh, yeah, no, that's not quite enough. Uh, maybe, it's it's settling out. You can you could crank it up a little, maybe bring it up to 2,000 or something. Yeah, and the other, yep, we'll give that a shot. Yeah, the other colors that we're seeing are these yellows. Mm -hmm. That actually shows, the darkness of that color shows the backscatter of the, of the uh, seafloor. So basically, if we send sound at the seafloor, it measures how loud our echo is when we get it back. Okay. Yeah, and that corresponds to the color. But right now, the seafloor is pretty consistent, so we aren't really seeing anything interesting. It just shows up as more or less constant yellow. So the louder your echo comes back, the... The red, the more the red color you would see? Uh, the more the yellow color. More the yellow. So if I can point with my cursor, these things coming in here. Okay. Yeah, so like that, if that'll like let us tell the difference between like rocks and mud and sand and that sort of thing. Everything, just like things have different color, things have different, uh, what, they, they, things have different color visually, acoustically, things have different intensity uh, acoustically. We can literally paint an image based off of the sounds that we get back. I think we made a whole loop around. Jason, our fearless leader, you didn't get to introduce yourself. Oh, um, yeah, Jason Fay. Uh, I'm serving as expedition leader and uh, on the 8 to 12 watch. Uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, we didn't do we the survey around the top. We, uh, we're really looking for complex vertical terrain, right? And so the more domed nature of um, the, the top of this feature um, didn't meet the way we had prepared the cameras and, um, and what we were looking for for the model. So we didn't want to uh, waste the dive time. We're going to go to the bottom and explore our way back up, and that way we can... Awesome. Um, we did choose the steep slope um, down the side of the feature. And so hopefully we'll get into that types of terrain that we were looking for uh, as we come back up. Now take us across the back. The front want to go? Navigation, can you oh yeah, yeah. share with us? Yeah, of course. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Johan Becker. I'm the navigator here uh, on this shift. Uh, I normally am at the University of Rhode Island as a graduate student in ocean engineering. Uh, there I'm working to kind of develop a new piece of technology uh, in the field of ocean instrumentation, another sensor that uh, looks at temperature along a fiber optic cable, which is a pretty interesting concept on its own. Uh, and here I'm working as the navigator and kind of positioning the ship and directing us and bringing us along to the spaces we want to see. Thank you. Keeping us straight. So, Johan, maybe you can tell the viewers how how somebody may be able to get in this position. Um, yeah, so I think there's many paths to uh, this kind of place. For me, uh, I did my undergrad in ocean engineering and marine biology at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, I worked a little bit in the in industry and came back to the university a year later uh, for, as well, ocean engineering. Um, yeah, there are opportunities out there. I've kind of selected a program and an advisor who has a lot of experience with ROV technology, uh, Brennan Phillips, who is an alum of the OET family. Um, 
Yeah, because I was always kind of interested in this and through him and through just being in the world and going on a few cruises, I've, I was able to end up here and I'm happy for it. and our pilot of Hercules today. I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, I'm uh, Robert Waters. Um, uh, my short job is uh, OET uh, facilities manager and ROV engineer. So I work, I manage our facility in San Pedro, California. So, uh, and I work on developing new hardware for the vehicles, the electronic side. Uh, and I'm out here as a Herc pilot. And yeah, I've been doing this for 27 years. Wow. So I also pilot the deep sea submersible Alvin. This awesome. is a manned submarine. What's that, what's that experience like? What's it like? You, In the submarine? Yeah. Um, so the difference between the view from the sub and from Herc is it's kind of like if you look at a picture of the Grand Canyon or if you go stand on the rim, you know? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> way to describe that. You're, li you're very limited to what you, your yeah. visual so, experience So, But is. what we're doing here is going to kind of give you some of that, right? Yeah. The, a, better, a better feeling of the, the scale of stuff. Yeah, I've been to the exact same dive sites with Herc and then with Alvin, and it's yeah, it's a whole different experience to to look at it. It, it just feels totally like you're in a different place, but but you recognize the landmarks, but it looks totally different. Yeah. So you prefer sitting in the control <laughs> in a van? nice, comfortable chair <laughs> or in a in a cold, cramped submarine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this sub. I mean, but I'm probably getting a little old for that. But <laughs> is it still operational? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 They just upgraded it a year and a half. Has it been a year and a half? Anyway, uh, I did a dive to 6,100 meters in the sub during a series of uh, the. Uh, Certification dives for its new rated depth, which is 6,500 meters. Wow. wow. That was in the Puerto Rican trench. How long is a descent like that? So they can, we can use more steel to go up and down if we're going deep, and mm -hmm. you can go 50 meters a minute. Okay. So you just go faster. Yeah. But you're dropping literally a ton <laughs> of steel on a dive. <laughs> That's quite a bit. <laughs> and who is our At Atlantis pilot today? Hi, I'm a uh, woman Moen. Um, I'm the ROV engineering intern who's piloting Atlanta today. Um, and at home, I'm a master's student in mechanical engineering at the University of Southern California. Um, yeah. What's this experience been like for you, Human? Uh, it's been really cool. This is my first time on a ship, uh, definitely for like this amount of time. Um, and piloting out Atlanta is really fun. And the whole explorative aspect of it has been really exciting. Come on, what did you, any um, interesting things that, that were different than what you expected being on the ship? Or, you know, better or worse? Just the, I'm uh, curious. Yeah, yeah, um, food is definitely a lot better than I expected. And there's oh, the a lot food. more of it than I also expected. Like, there's a lot of variety. Uh, generally, uh, the ship's been, I feel like, pretty comfortable to, you know, just live in. Yeah. I was kind of expecting it to be a, a little bit more harsh than it is. Uh, it's not to say that it's, like, 
the most comfortable thing in the world, but it's been pretty nice. Maybe that's because we haven't gotten into rough seas this trip, though. <laughs> yeah, it looks good for the the rest of the trip, too, as I've been looking at the weather, trying to plan a couple of days ahead. Uh, tomorrow, we've got a little bit of a transit day and a short dive, hopefully, and then uh, and that the weather will be good at that site, and then we'll head out to McCall Seamount, which is a little bit more exposed, but in the in the wind lee potentially of the Big Island, and uh, so unless there's a big south swell, and we should be. In and that's good where shape we'll see those too. hydrothermal vents. No, that'll no? be uh, that'll be around the first. Oh, November okay. First, yeah. Okay. Still on the list, but we're just kind of reshuffling the order a bit to be as efficient as possible. Johan, I had someone asking, when you're communicating to the bridge with the numbers that you're saying, what is that that you're actually communicating? Yeah, so the first number I give uh, is the distance in meters that I want the ship to move, and then the second step, which is usually three digits, so 090 or 360, or something like that, is the bearing or direction that I want uh, the ship to make its move in. So distance and direction. Thank you. And then when Robert, we were talking about um, going down 50 meters in that steel. Someone wants to know more importantly, how long does it take to come up from a dive that deep uh, in a sub? The, the same, actually. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You drop, uh, yeah, you drop half your steel when you get down it, and then the other half to go back up. Yeah. <laughs> And is there a comparison between Alvin and how deep Hurt can go? Which one goes deeper? Uh, Alvin can go deeper. Hercules is a uh, 5,000 meter, no, four. is that true? 4,000 meter, 4,000 meter. Atlanta can go deeper, but uh, yeah, Alvin's the, the deepest of the bunch right now. It used to not be, it was 4,500 meters. And I just made it 6,500 meters. <coughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on it. Is there a particular piece of equipment on Hercules that restricts it from going past a certain depth because of the pressure, like say for the camera lenses? Well, yeah, there's definitely a lot of the, what, what Dan refers to as the jewelry. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of that that's not rated to that depth. And it's, the things are exponentially more expensive to, to go, the deeper you go, it's exponentially yeah. increased in cost and things get heavier and bigger and yeah, so. It's it's a problem. It's not an easy thing to go deeper. Yeah. So, so the the syntactic foam's a big deal. Uh, and for our viewers, that would be the yellow casing that we see at the top of Hercules. Yeah. It's uh, what it's what it is is it's uh, little microscopic glass beads, hollow beads, in a epoxy matrix. Which is something like uh, model airplane builders actually use something similar to that because it makes up for a lightweight, huh. rigid foam. Yeah. All right, and I think we have one more person on the front row. Video, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I was hoping you were going to forget about I was, I know you were. <laughs> I'm uh, Pete. I uh, am a uh, video engineer by trade. I have been in this business for a very long time, over 25 years or so. And so this is a very unique opportunity to learn um, a new way that broadcast technology is, is used. Um, and we have an incredible system here. It's a, it's a broadcast uh, standard system. You can see this equipment in 
any broadcast environment that you go to. So when I got here, I was like, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that. So it was pretty straightforward to come in and operate the gear. And that's the opposite for me. Like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which button to push. There's a lot of buttons here. There's a lot of buttons, yeah. Don't press the red button. Don't press the red button. I have a button button. <laughs> There's a button labeled button. <laughs> An important button. Too. Bob's it got, is. Bob's got a very uh, eclectic array of buttons. <laughs> yeah, you do. It's it's claimed that I asked for the button button. But I know that <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> is there an easy button? Yeah. Uh, uh, no. There's no easy button. Uh, one, I of have these, a, one of these boxes has a coin slot in it. I have a 30 second dance party button I keep in my classroom. <laughs> Kids need to take a break and hit that button. Uh -huh. uh, the other thing we do and, and, and are responsible for is all records uh, for all the cameras on the ROV, uh, including um, the uh, uh, records for the top side, meaning the deck operations when we launch and recover. So uh, very important to have those records on hand um, for safety purposes, and we always keep an eye um, on our crew on the back to make sure that we're um, making sure that they're in the scene. And um, yeah, we also get to route what goes down channel three. On so, channel three, um, yeah. Open for requests if anybody wants to see <laughs> any um, other shots. As soon as we start seeing some more, I had uh, someone earlier post that they they thought that one of our cameras should be giving us the view of the front, the bow of the boat, so that we can see the sunrise, sunset, just open water. We do our best to get that shot out there. Usually, yeah. when we're in a dive, we kind of keep it focused around what's going on with the dive itself. But I love our bow shot. Oh, it's that beautiful. Is. The monkey, the monkey deck has been my go-to place. Kristen can verify pretty much every time she goes up. She's like, oh, there you are again. Yep, there I am. Camped out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, my Kevin. <laughs> that's my favorite camera right there is that guy. I love yeah, that, shot. that is a, it's a beautiful shot. And it's always live. And um, yeah, you uh, can see how the weather is at any given time, especially when we're not in an ROD dive. So. Robert from Vancouver, British Columbia. Terry wants to know, what did they do to Alvin to increase its max depth? So it was a long process. Uh, like, uh, I think it took over 10 years to do all the things that they had to do. <clears throat> they started with a new personnel sphere, which is like by far the biggest expense. But So that, yeah, the personnel sphere got upgraded. It's a uh, three inch thick titanium. Uh, seven feet in diameter and um, <clears throat> it's sphericity like how how much of a perfect sphere it is within ten thousandths over the whole the whole certain wow diameter or circumference of the thing it's very precise yeah wow. yeah I got to see the uh, the welding when they took the two hemispheres. I didn't see them when they forged the hemispheres or machined them. But in Los Angeles, they they had a big vacuum chamber with a with an electron beam welder, and they and they welded the the two halves of the hemispheres together. That was an electron beam welder. Well, yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, you can imagine welding a three-inch thick titanium. Like in a perfect world, right? That's like that world has to be right. <laughs> wow. There can't be many facilities that can do that sort of work in the states. There's not. And then they they actually at the Naval Academy is a pressure chamber, and I think it's one of two in the world. One in Russia and, and the one there in Annapolis and. Uh, they, they put the sphere in there and tested it to uh, like one and a half times the rated depth. So. Yeah, it's across the Severn River from the Naval Academy. Yeah. So I got to see that too. That was pretty cool.
here watching our satellite feed, you're going to start to see some changes take place. We've got a shift change coming up. Keep those questions coming in. And appreciate all the help with the phonics and spelling. So those upgrades to the submarine cost $60 million. $60 million. <laughs> $60 million. How, yeah. often does, <laughs> how often do they go out in Alvin? Um, they have a full schedule now. Really? Yeah. They, yeah, they're full up. Like, where does he reside? Or where does <clears throat> it reside? It's, it's uh, designed, built, Operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Woods Hole, okay. It's uh, certified by the U.S. Navy, and it's uh, <coughs> it's Navy property, but they've never actually taken it. <coughs> Way back in the '60s, they used it to recover a, uh, a nuclear bomb that had fallen from a bomber off of uh, Spain. Wow, jeez. So April, yes, as a science communications fellow, I um, my task is to be on watch. Our watches here are four hour watches. So I run the eight to 12. Uh, and then I take a, a break from doing this watch, but I'm also working and doing uh, ship to shore connections with with schools also working on photo albums and then just trying to catch up with the other responsibilities that are around the ship and then i'll be back on watch from 8 to 12 if we're diving so we might have some free time might not just depends on uh, what our dive schedule looks like you definitely stay busy and no matter what position you're on on the ship there's always something to do people to support and help if you possibly can it's been a wonderful opportunity you can find out more info on becoming an intern uh, on nautiluslive.org. Yes, thank you for that. In fact, if uh, we have an intern still, we could ask them how they did the how the process to become an intern on board uh, it goes. Well, I know for me, it just started off with um, I just I got the email and looked into it. Thought that was something very interesting that I might take a gander at and then that turned into the application turned into a little bit of a essay some phone calls and then a final interview and a dow there i was here i am yeah i started about that process probably february maybe now maybe a little sooner than that maybe yeah it's january ish do we want to try and speed this up this is kind of pokey huh Yeah, uh, 0 0.3. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, about 280 more meters. Yeah. Video will be offline for a uh, momentary second or two while we do a watch change. Bridge, bridge, nav, can you increase the speed to 0 0.3 knots, please? Thank you. I want to thank everybody for following along and participating with your questions and enjoying the views with us and the discoveries that we've seen today. My shift is just about up and Ale will be taking over. She is on our next 12 to 4 shift. It's all right.
Thanks for tuning in and we will see you next time. Johan, Johan, how far is it to Waypoint 2? Um, it is about, or exactly, 275 meters away. 275 meters away. Thank you very much. No problem. We just increased speed, so oh, good. hopefully we'll get there a little sooner.
No worries, Chris. It looks like we have fully switched over to the 12 to 4 watch, so thanks for joining us. Our current depth is 632 meters, and we are um, exploring a seamount uh, at South Point Pinnacles right outside the big island of Hawaii. I think Jonathan should be singing over SPL, not just to us. <laughs> well, I think it's being picked up over SPL, and I think it's a wonderful ephemeral background noise. <laughs> so we're on, on top. I, I, somebody asked on the earlier watch, is this a seamount or not? It's a, it's a tough question. You know, a seamount is usually defined as coming a 1,000 meters above the surrounding seafloor, and this one does. This one, on one side, it does. So on one side it goes down to 2,000 meters, and the top is is over oh, at 600 something meters. So that's over a thousand meters. So looking from that side, it would be a seamount. But on the other side, it, <laughs> it doesn't it's at not all. It's not a It's much, it's much, much less of a difference. If there's one really steep and deep side, one shallow side. So I don't know what you'd call it—a a, semi seamount or a, a demi seamount. <laughs> seamount. Yeah. So yet, so yesterday we we. Uh, we had a nice transit up it on, on the steep side, and uh, today we've uh, kind of traveled along the crest, and uh, as soon as the Hercules got down there, it was uh, greeted by a, a large school of uh, rat tail fish, which was quite interesting and exciting, and I thought they were kind of loners. I didn't know that they hung out in such such big schools. Yeah, I have they, never seen that before. Yeah, so that was kind of neat. Now, it doesn't surprise me that you'd have a lot of activity at the, the top of the seamount because that's where the upwelling and the currents get disrupted the most. Uh, but then they, they seem to disappear and come back and disappear and come back. So they're not everywhere there. And so now we're just, we're transiting along the crest line and we're going to dip over uh, to a kind of a secondary saddle and make our way down now there. And what we're doing is uh, using uh, a really nifty um, multi-beam sonar, high-resolution multi-beam sonar called the Norbit, uh, which is mounted on Hercules. And uh, KK, Chris, uh, who's our navigator this watch, has, uh, has some wonderful real-time software that lets us look. I don't know if that's going out yet. Yeah, it's going out of a satellite uh, feed three. So we're seeing, uh, you can see a very, very small little image of the Hercules scale and then the the mapping it's doing in the in the different colors green mostly getting to blue which means deeper uh, reds even shallower Chris is twisting it around there so Chris are you are you on SPL now Chris yep just got here okay and uh, can you give us an idea of what kind of ranges you're seeing to either side I was of, uh, uh, I was muted there sir uh, hang on a second I uh, ranges to either side yeah 
So as we look up the slope, we can't see quite as oh, far, good. but we actually, as we do that, we actually get uh, a little better data, a higher point density, but it looks like we can see maybe 40 meters right. to port and down the slope, we're seeing almost 120 meters. And that's that right there is the huge difference between the ability of the sonar, which propagates so well, the sound propagates so well in the water, uh, versus our cameras. Jonathan has has worked very hard with wonderful lighting systems and wonderful cameras to give us the largest field of view we can. But that field of view, Jonathan, is tens of meters at most, yeah. and and so. Of course, it's much higher resolution. So that's that's the trade-off. The kind of things we're trying to do is capture that larger scale picture of, of the, the morphology, the shape of the seafloor with the sonar. And what you're seeing on the satellite feed is a, a reduced version of what, what Chris will eventually be able to produce with respect to, to resolution. And then the cameras, which, which capture to the, to the millimeter in terms of resolution. Yep. Uh, but again, a, a, a limited, uh, limited range. And so it's a, uh, well, it strikes me that's that's the way you know satellite altimetry really rapidly gives you that global view and and yeah. the closer and closer you get the the finer and finer that beam is until it's just literally recording the the little tiny pool of light a little tiny little pathway up yeah up you'll have to like eventually we're going down the down yeah, the it's a constant trade-off uh, that we have in the ocean in terms of trade-off of coverage versus fine. resolution it's a it's kind of fundamental Fundamental we do. constraint of physics. Autos everything. What are some okay. of the, uh, the auto what, what, really what prioritizes today. for you, What's that? you know, from, from your position with uh, Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, you know, what are what, what determines the priority areas to map in these fine resolutions? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. T to be honest, uh, Bob played with the auto we heading are PID rarely loops. at SECOM, the center, um, area focused. Um, that seems unless high. there's a specific problem that no one needs. We're a research lab, and so so we're pushing the development of technologies and approaches, um, and we'll often so get, leave it to other parts suggest, of NOAA to uh, say where we need to apply it. We'll we'll try to find the right trade-off of tools to, to meet the, the what they're trying to uh, accomplish. But once it comes to what I would call production so mapping, just kind of mowing the lawn for covering ground. Uh, then we, we would step back and leave that to, to others, sometimes the commercial sector um, or, or other other. Uh, let's try this before I do groups. that. Yeah. Um, Can you come yeah, down? We, uh, we, we, we kind of always want to be living at the uh, leading, but it's often the bleeding yeah. the bleeding <laughs> edge <laughs> of technology. Yeah. And, the, and then hopefully as we kind of uh, that vehicles out, that with the tether coming out of the back struggle with heading mode. vehicles with ones coming um, out the top struggle the, with the uh, exception to that is that for uh, well from 2003 to almost 2019 um, we were mandated by congress to do the mapping and support of uh, a u.s submission under the law of the sea treaty for what's called an extended continental shelf the ability for a, a country to extend its sovereign rights over the resources of the seafloor and the subsea um, beyond 200 I forget miles when it's called country. Then. Uh, is that they come in at like 80 or if something? There are certain morphological certain <laughs> shape characteristics of the seafloor of the continental margin. Uh, and so we were charged with I doing that mapping. I so forget. there we had very area what specific targets. Hmm. And they were all around the continental margin. I want to say the this US. one's uh, 100 Much meters. of it in Alaska. We had uh, probably 11 cruises uh, on the icebreaker Healy yeah. on the Alaska margin into the ice to try <laughs> to map how far the U.S. continental shelf, not the geologic continental shelf, but the, the legal, what they call juridical the white continental shelf. Cutting wow. there, how far that would extend, meters. and it extends quite far. And I just heard today that uh, the limits of that extension are going to be publicly announced on the 14th of December of this year. That's uh, wow. after 20, 23 years of work. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make that announcement on December 14th.